evening, everybody. My name is Faye Fone from the Greeting of Detroit. We are so happy to have everyone here for this really exciting event that merges science and art and health and community. Excellent. So I'm just going to do a little quick um, overview of the agenda today and then let the individuals speak. So this evening, um, we just had the amazing jazz trio uh, play for us. Thank you so much. If you have business cards or records for sale, let everyone know before you head out to your next gig. Yes. <laughs> um, and so uh, this part of the agenda, uh, we will have a few words from our president, um, Lionel Bradford from the Greening of Detroit. After that, uh, Dr. Uh, James Blessman will introduce Dr. Tracy Baker, who we've been working uh, quite a bit with to understand her research, uh, the amazing research she's been doing related to pollutants and understanding what's in our water. Um, and then after that, uh, there'll be a Q&A. And after that, we will um, then have our finale event of, uh, of, of artistic visualization on the river of, these, of, of pollutants in our water. So, um, without, oh, actually, let me thank some additional partners. Um, Detroit Future City is a major partner with Land and Water Works. Um, Land and Water Works is a coalition of 10 independent nonprofits that are uh, eager to um, build uh, support and build the capacity of community members to become ambassadors to share uh, the importance of uh, land and water in Detroit. Um, also, Sidewalk Detroit, I'm not sure if they're here today, but they uh, helped us to scope out a space where we could do this activity. Um, they are, have, a, have a, had a long-term relationship with Eliza Howell, and will be doing some really exciting stormwater work uh, this coming year and next year. So, if, did I, anything else I'm missing, Nicole, for Land and Water Works? Oh, oh, and Cures. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, I, got, I got some more people. I'm sorry. I got a, I got a six-month-old baby. I can't remember everything. Um, so we also have Sierra Club. Uh, Quinton is from Sierra Club and has also supported us in this work. And last but not least, um, Cures. We have Brian Smith all the way in the back there. They're doing amazing work supporting their uh, researchers and getting, making sure we, they're getting that Im important information out to community members about uh, quality of life regarding asthma, uh, water quality, and so forth. So uh, with that, oh my, oh my gosh, and Cindy Ross, I won't look at her right now so she can finish eating her sandwich. Um, Cindy Ross is from Friends of the Rouge River, and she has been such a, an amazing partner, both from Land and Water Works, um, but also with the work that they do um, throughout the Rouge River watershed, which is where we are right now, which is within the watershed. So um, we have some exciting uh, information back here. If you didn't have a chance to check them out before um, we started uh, speaking, make sure to check it out on your way out. Um, there's an amazing Enviroscape where you can actually see um, how stormwater, different land uses create uh, different stormwater issues. <laughs> so, uh, so without further ado, I will pass the mic on to our president, Lionel Bradford. Where <laughs> Thank you, Faye. Hello, everyone. I am Lionel Bradford. I'm the president and executive director of the Greening of Detroit. And I'll just lend to what Faye is saying by welcoming you as well to our first annual, I think I can say annual, lantern run. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to see what this would be, although I have to leave soon. Uh, there's going to be some taped footage that I can see what happens with this. So I'm very excited. Uh, but one of the few things I want to say, uh, this year the Greening of Detroit is celebrating our 30th anniversary. And so, um, thank you. Over that time, we planted over 130,000 trees throughout the city. Uh, we've employed nearly 3,000 uh, youth and uh, high school youth in Detroit through our Green Corps Summer Youth Employment Pro Program, and uh, several other things that I, I try to uh, uh, tag along with this with this 30-year anniversary. You get it, 130,000 trees, 3,000 youth. And so uh, it's, it's been quite a, 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 a nice journey for us. Uh, but one of the things, we could not have done any of the work that we've done without collaborations. Uh, none of our work would be sustainable without collaborations. So we're, we're very thankful to be part of Land and Water Works, um, very thankful to be a, a part of Cures and, and others. And, and we will continue to, to collaborate with, with other uh, nonprofits and, and neighborhood groups and block clubs to continue to do the good work that we do. Um, today's demonstration will, will, will just show you what Faye is saying about what's in our water today. 
um, the, the, the pollutants that come down from, from storm water and really talk about, uh, at least alert you to why green st uh, storm water infrastructure is so important in the city. And so I won't be, uh, 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 keep you guys too long, but I do want to say welcome, 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 and thank you for coming. I think this is just awesome to see all of us out in Liza Howell Park today, the nice band or what have you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, next, Dr. James Blessman. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. Good evening. First of all, let me have a round for you guys for being here. I think that's really fantastic that you would come out and kind of check this out. That's, that's really good. It's a beautiful event. I really thank Greening of Detroit. So I'm, I'm with Wayne State University and Cures, you know, Center for Urban Responses to Environmental Stressors. You know, and what we're really about is trying to understand the relationship between uh, the environment and our health. And, um, you know, there are biologic issues, there are chemical issues, there are physical issues, there are actually social issues, what I'm, which is what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm very interested in social fitness and trying to build better citizens, kind of uh, uh, actually smart consumers, because the way that you, the things that you buy, can have a big impact on the things in which we are exposed to, which you'll learn a little bit about uh, tonight. And that's really why I wear the hat, because um, it says the D gets an A. You know, my goal is to uh, have a citizen report card trying to create cities of A's. I don't wear this hat to be cool. I think I am cool. <laughs> That's not why I wear the hat. This hat kind of represents my vision board. I think it's important to keep your purpose in front of you kind of at all times. Uh, and it helps to control my words. But uh, uh, moving on then, uh, I'm very excited for what you're going to hear this evening. We have uh, Dr. Tracy Baker who's going to come before you. Um, uh, you know, and to speak to her, um, she started off as a swimmer. Uh, so she's very familiar with the water. Um, I asked her, was she Olympic material? And she said, yeah, kind of. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, but she was good. You know, she was very good. Went on to do marine biology uh, uh, in Alaska. Is that correct? Yeah. And then uh, went to uh, veterinary school also. So she is very familiar in terms of the relationship between water and kind of uh, animal health and whatnot. Is very passionate about it. And I'm, I'm really grateful for the work that she does. I mean, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, attention to water because of what has happened in Flint. But if you really look at it, that is really only a tip of the iceberg when you think about the things that we are potentially exposed to. And so I'm very grateful for those who would have a look at that and help, help, to, help to educate me so that I know how to change my behavior to maybe decrease some of my exposures. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Tracy Baker. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I was not an Olympic swimmer, but um, thank, thanks for embellishing that. I appreciate that. I could have been. I could have been. Um, it's so great to see you all here today. I'm excited to talk to you about the research that we're doing at the Water Lab and at Wayne State, um, and super excited to see the visual that we're going to have here tonight because a lot of our research went into um, basically coming up with the categories and you know the different colors and the number of lanterns. So it's nice to see that transition from science to art, um, and so. I'm super excited about that, um, and thank you for Greening of Detroit um, for putting this together, Ryan and, and Sam. Um, it's It's been great working with you guys. So I'm just going to give a little bit uh, talking about my research, and then hopefully you guys will have some questions um, about the things that I'm going to talk about. So as you would imagine, um, with industry and agriculture and population growth, there are a lot of environmental contaminants that have been in the environment um, and you know in the 50s 60s there were there were a huge number of contaminants um, luckily for us due to activists um, and toxicologists scientists politicians a lot of those 
contaminants have been decreased. Um, the Clean Water Act in the 1970s uh, regulated, you know, a lot of industry regulated wastewater treatment plants. And so, you know, a lot of those chemicals have decreased, which is great. Um, the things that we're looking at are emerging contaminants. So these are new chemicals um, that are in the environment, things are, that are recently being produced, or things that we never really thought about that could have health effects that we are finding in the environment. So what our study, briefly, was that we looked along um, the Detroit River, so starting at the Huron River down to Lake Erie, we, took, we looked at six different sites and we took um, samples of river water. And so we started, um, Lake St. Clair Metro Park was one of the areas, so we were out on the water in the boat with USGS taking water samples out in the river. Um, another one of our sites is right next to the Great Lake, Lake Water Authority um, drinking water treatment plant, so where the intake comes in um, and, and the water gets processed, we took a sample out there. That water gets processed for four million people for most of the Detroit metro area. Um, and then we also took a sample right at the mouth of the Rouge River. So uh, the chemicals that we found there are kind of what we're looking at um, with the lanterns. Uh, and then we also looked downstream. And by far, the Rouge River had more contaminants than, than any of the other sites. And unfortunately, downstream, a lot of these chemicals, we're still seeing that. And there is a drinking water treatment plant um, that's, that's downriver as well. So that's, that, this is why we're concerned about it. Um, we're also concerned because a lot of these chemicals, uh, because they're emerging, because they're new, we don't know what the health effects are. We don't know how they're affecting wildlife. We don't know how they're affecting people. We don't know how they're getting, how they're like traveling through drinking water treatment plants. Um, so that's why we're interested in looking at them. So in the Rouge River, uh, some of the major classes of contaminants that we found um, were sugars, so sucralose and HK, ACE K. So these are synthetic sugars that are in pretty much everything, um, toothpaste, uh, chewing gum, a lot of food. Um, but because they're synthetic, they don't break down. So they just stay in the water um, and, you know, maybe part, some of them, a low level, wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't worry about them because we, we eat them, but the fish um, and, you know, other aquatic animals, you know, aren't used to having high levels of sugar in the environment. And, and like I say, by far, that's one of the, the largest things that we found in the environment. Um, we also found a number of uh, pharmaceuticals. So like acetaminophen, um, which is an anti-inflammatory. We found anti-cholesterol drugs, um, heart medications, diabetes drugs, uh, contrast agents that are used in medical facilities. So a lot of those we found out in the river as well in detectable levels. Um, another, um, Pesticides were another thing that we looked for and found. So these were pesticides that are used in agriculture, um, so in, in big industry agriculture, but also pesticides that are put on lawns and are sold over the counter. So some of these are running off and, and getting into um, the river as well. Um, we also looked at um, PFAS chemicals, so fluorinated compounds. We've heard a lot about that recently in the news. These are forever chemicals um, that, again, stay around for tens to hundreds of years. Some of them don't ever break down. Um, and so these are also, there are potential health effects of these chemicals. Um, they're like in waterproofing. Um, uh, mostly they're used for waterproofing. So Gore-Tex, um, like when you do like when you wash different um, like raincoats and things like that, they can come off um, as well as they've been water, there was a Wolverine waterproofing plant for boots. And so that was, that's a huge issue um, in Michigan. Uh, and, and another, a number of other reasons are in popcorn bags and paper um, fast food wrappers. So those are making their way into the river as well. And then um, microplastics. So microplastics are uh, a huge issue. Um, 
they are from water bottles and um, other pellet, like um, plastic manufacturing and other plastics, trash, plastic bags that get into the water and break down into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, and then they, the, one of the major issues is that fish and birds can eat them and they can basically, they um, impact their stomach and then they can't feed anymore and so they, they can starve because of that. But we're looking at um, these effects on humans as well uh, because there was a study where they looked at bottled water and drink tap water and nearly 90% of those have um, microplastics in them. So, you know, we are, we are um, basically being, uh, we are being exposed to them, but we're still looking at what some of the health effects are. So how are these getting into the water? Um, excretion is one way, so we're taking these medicines, you know, we're putting personal care products on, and then it's going down the shower, it's going down the toilet, and that, that's how they're getting out. Some, another issue is um, with some of the medicines that people flush them down the toilet, and so that's another way that they're getting into this, into the wastewater treatment plant. Unfortunately, the wastewater treatment plants don't take out these chemicals. So, um, wastewater treatment plants, you know, a lot of them are aging, and they, you know, they weren't made to take out these small chemicals. They were made to, you know, decrease waste that was in the water that was going out. But a lot of these wastewater treatment plants were made before we had um, diabetes drugs and before we had birth control pills. And, you know, like they, these, they just weren't made for that. So they, they're not taking them out of the water. Um, so that's another way that they're getting into the water, runoff from fields, from lawns. Um, and so, you know, what can we do that, you know, I mean, the good news is, is that a lot of these are in small amounts, smaller amounts than some of the legacy contaminants that we had in the 50s and 60s. Um, the pharmaceuticals that are in the water, I mean, we take these pharmaceuticals, there have been human tests done on these pharmaceuticals. So, I mean, they, they are safe for us um, at certain levels. So, you know, it's, that is also good news. Um, and so how, what, what can we do? And so as consumers, uh, like Dr. Blessman was saying, you know, not buying some of the personal care products that have these chemicals in them. There's a lot of cosmetics and there's a lot of makeups that have PFAS chemicals in them. Um, so if we're not buying them, then there'll be more of, you know, companies will make changes. I mean, they have made some changes, but there's still a lot of other chemicals that are in there. Um, and so voting, talking to our politicians, and then making consumer choices um, are just different ways that, that we can make a difference. And then there's also, um, they put together this great brochure, and in it um, gives some ideas for, you know, decreasing our single-use plastics, not using straws um, and water bottles, you know, reusing water bottles, um, using sweeteners instead of, you know, Splenda or some of the other sugars. Um, and so different things like that that we can do to help with the, this issue. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have about five minutes. We've got about five minutes. Um, does anyone have any questions? All right. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll pass the mic to you. Uh, how does uh, synthetic sugar break down in the environment? Does it bioaccumulate in animals or like where does it go? Does it is just kind of recycle back into the water. Um, what's like the route it takes? Um, so unfortunately it, it doesn't break down very much at all. So it does bioaccumulate um, as like as the smaller fish eat it and then it kind of goes up through the food chain and then eventually we would eat it to some degree. But I mean it it just stays in the environment for long amounts of time. They actually use it as a marker to see like how much wastewater is in um, like an area. So they, because it doesn't break down, different agencies use it as a marker to look at pollution. Hi, good evening. My name is Cheryl and I am proudly one of the ambassadors with the Land and Water Works. Uh, through the Detroit um, future city and my question there are two parts are there um, different lab assays lab values 
or lab tests that can be done to start looking at what the uh, serum levels are that are, could be accumulating and we as at the top of the chain, eh, um, humans, and then other life forms, you know, other aquatic life forms as well. And the second is that um, there are, there was a company that I saw in the paper recently that is actually, uh, they call it trash fishing, where they're dredging and trying very hard. I mean, you know, we know how it looks to see turtles choking on straws and and all of that. Where it the, the the problem has been very carefully articulated, but how can we? You you suggested some lifestyle changes, but do, if there are measures of what we are doing um, to be able to see the accumulation, because the liver can only do so much in terms of detoxing, mm -hmm. and our bodies have to are built to build and not to just keep de detoxing. Right. So what has been, again, lab values that, um, that could have be able to detect, and then what can be done in terms of um, a huge movement in dredging uh, the rivers with some kind of modern day technology to rid those contaminants, the larger ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there are some, um, labs that can be done because they're emerging contaminants. A lot of those are emerging as well, the technologies. Um, but for some of these chemicals, especially the pharmaceuticals, you, you would be able to look at them. And, and we're starting to go out and look in the fish that are in the rouge right. um, to look for some of the chemicals as well. And then there are um, a number of engineers that are looking into ways. Um, I, I don't think there's any great way yet uh, for as far as dredging. The problem with dredging is that you bring up a lot of contaminants from the 40s, 50s, and 60s that are down in the sediment that are, are kind of locked down in there. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of a hard, a hard thing to do. Hi, I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit about how um, you propose behavior changes for stopping pharmaceuticals from going into water? Um, yeah, so, I mean, we cannot flush them down the toilet is one way for, you know, we can start trying to regulate um, hospital, you know, what they're putting into the waste streams. Um, so, I mean, that would, that would not be us doing that. That would be... Um, that would be hospitals. Um, and then just regulation in general back to the pharma companies because the way that it's regulated right now, they can put, you know, they're saying there's so many parts per million um, that they that can be put in there and they're saying it's safe. Um, but, you know, it, it accumulates over time. And so like in Europe, uh, the, there's a lot more testing. It's, there's a lot more rigor about what can be put down the drain and what what pharma companies have to do um, before they can before you know these things can happen. Um, so the rouge over all the years, you know, it's been 50 years since I did my first cleanup. I think um, has all these things that have impeded its flow from the rouge channel you know, to, to dumping, to this, to that, and the other. And we do stir up the sediment um, just by cleaning. Um, ha have you, number one, have you looked at how many of the things that you sampled in the water also have uh, particulate matter that we'll see in the silt um, so that we can make recommendations? That would be the first one. And then, um, the second one is um, how do we um, begin the mass marketing of the ideas of, of what this is? And uh, there's been a lot of studies. The third one would be there's been a lot of studies of these mystery chemicals that companies are not labeling or not saying. And um, we know that with the changes in the Clean Water Act, what happened is that they're now it's now getting 
through the drain systems into the soil, but then the soil is put on the banks, and as the soil erodes out, the chemical goes back in. Right. So, so how, are, how, how can we address all of that? Yeah, how, good questions. Um, so the, we have not looked at sedimentation. I mean, other people have for some of these. Again, they're emerging, so it, I mean, it also depends on the river. So depending on how much particulate is in the river, some of these can get caught and, and brought down to the bottom. Um, the PFAS chemicals, they like to sit at the top of the water, um, but there are some other chemicals that are more like lipophilic that would go down to the bottom. Um, as far as the regulations, um, what was your second question? Um, just how, it's not, how we're not regulating what goes into the dirt. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of that, yeah, we're just going to have to do more testing um, and then, you know, try to get the word out. I think if enough people are saying, like, this isn't okay, then um, we can hopefully get some changes and, again, trying to make the companies that are producing this and putting it out into the water, I mean, that would be the best place to make a change. Otherwise, there's infrastructure changes. But, you know, that's, again, would be the city of Detroit or city of wherever, you know, having to do all the cleanup for a company that is, you know, is basically just putting it in there. Um, so I have uh, one comment, two questions. The comment is, um, I wanted to respond to the lifestyle issue on the pharmaceuticals. Just keep in mind that many of the pharmaceuticals are for chronic disease, and 80% of that is due to lifestyle. We have control over that um, by how well we sleep, how well we eat, how much exercise we get, and that type of thing. Uh, we can get a significant amount of that to go Thank away. You. Right? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So we have control. Uh, to the two questions, one is, um, are there microplastics in capsules? And my second question is, or, or I think this is correct, because you mentioned acetaminophen, and I think acetaminophen depletes glutathione, which is a kind of a major antioxidant that our bodies make, so that's what helps us to prevent us from rusting it from the inside out and that type of thing, so I, I think that's correct. So that's, yeah, that's, that's a big right. issue. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a number of these chemicals, including, yes, that oxidative stress that could be caused, um, you know, if to both wildlife and to us, um, either through eating fish or through water, uh, you know, would be are important, even at low levels. So a lot of these can disrupt um, endocrine systems. So most or a number of these chemicals are endocrine disrupting chemicals. and. Um, that basically means that it can act on your brain. Um, they basically act like hormones, and in our bodies, we don't need much change in hormone um, to cause health effects. And so, you know, fairly low levels of these chemicals could could then cause changes um, in hormone regulation and, and, and endocrine disruption. I also, before I'm done, I want to um, thank my two of my PhD students who are here, um, and they've also done a lot of work on this project. So we've got time for one more question. Um, my question is just how can maybe the average resident who may not be very well versed in environmental studies take certain practices to examine what is in our water and how can we become more environmentally friendly? Yeah, um, there, I mean, there are some tests that are done in, like, our drinking water. And so Great Lakes Water Authority has on their website some of these chemicals, some of the tests. Um, but a lot of these are, are older chemicals and not the emerging contaminants. Um, so, I mean, through events like this and other events, I mean, you know, we want to make these kind of things public. Um, I think... If we can get, you know, I'm working with Great Lakes Water Authority, looking at different PFAS discharges. If we can get some of these emerging contaminants, you know, where those are put up on a, a site and where that can be tracked, I think that would be great. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, there are things, like I said, with, with the plastics um, and with um, the pesticides, like not putting pesticides on your lawn. Um, also, you know, maybe eating more organic food because, you know, if there's a need for that, if, if consumers are eating, you know, more organic food than more will be produced, people that are using pesticides may switch over to producing organic food. Um, so as much as possible, I think being able to, you know, and, and using, not using plastics as much as possible, but that's really hard because everything is in plastic. Um, not purchasing some of the sugars, uh, you know, just trying to eat naturally um, put natural uh, products on plants um, and you know those kinds of things mm -hmm.